Hello and welcome to Jazz Tonight. I'm Michael Jacoby, executive producer of Jazz on the Plaz and host of Raising the Standards on KSCO Radio in Santa Cruz. Welcome as we continue our summer homage to Billie Holiday and this is our uh, 15th year of Jazz on the Plaz. Uh, first, big thank you, and I do this every week and will continue to do so because we're so blessed that we're around. Uh, a thank you to the good folks at O'Connor Hospital, part of Verity Health, who are our sponsors this year. And uh, if I keep doing this right, we'll sign them for the next 15. With me in the studio, Matthew Kaminsky. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Matthew, it's, it's good to see you. Uh, you will be joined, and we will be joined later, by uh, Kimberly uh, Gordon, uh, a marvelous vocalist. Let's talk about, uh, people often say to me, how do you get these people to come here? And my, my answer invariably is I give them money. <laughs> but also, more importantly, how do, how do I find folks? And, and either you or your people, as we say, mm -hmm. sent me a couple of your CDs, mm -hmm. uh, the one at Churchill Downs. Mm -hmm. Live at Churchill Grounds. Grounds, mm -hmm. Churchill Grounds, yeah. yeah, which is not Churchill Downs, <laughs> uh, which is a marvelous CD, mm -hmm. and Kimberly's on it. Correct. And I, I just fell in love with it, and I called you, I said, I gotta get you out here. Yeah. And the rest is, as of tonight, will be history. Well, um, getting me to come out to California yeah, is tough, as much tough, of a tough, tough thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you're a Chicago boy. Yeah, grew up in Chicago, uh, right by O'Hare Airport. Um, saw the planes kind of landing over my head right. in Park Ridge. How long? How yeah. long to go for that to lose its charm? <laughs> well, you know, when you're a kid, you when don't really. Oh, you man, think it's the coolest another. thing. Yeah. Why are you drinking? Well, um, shoveling snow got really. Uh, uh, taxing on me. Yeah. So I ended up going to the University of Arizona in Tucson. My God, you got yeah. out of there. <laughs> so I went, I went cross country. Yeah. <laughs> I was there for a couple of years, and while I was in Tucson, my parents moved to Savannah, Georgia. Oh. Well, what, so, what was your major? Uh, uh, GF studies. Now, and I want to finish up on that, but tell me a little bit about growing up music around the house. Yeah, my dad plays the accordion. Okay. Um, so I come from a big Polish family. Okay. Um, so polka music, Lawrence Welk was okay. huge, yeah. <laughs> and even actually even country music. Mm -hmm. We would make trips down to like Branson, Missouri, oh, sure. and uh, Dollywood and Opryland. <laughs> so somehow my parents got polka and country music. Wow, <laughs> quite a culture shock. Yeah. Uh, and then how did you uh, come across the B3? Actually, I started playing the organ when I was five. Okay. Um, I'm not too sure why my dad didn't start me on the accordion since he played. Um, but he was, like I said, he was a big Lawrence Welk fan, so he wanted me to play that kind of Lawrence Welk style of organ playing. Yeah. And there's a girl named Ethel Smith, who is kind of, they call her the Latin from Manhattan. Okay. And I was playing that kind of almost theater slash pop organ style when I first learned. You know, I throw out that model number casually. The B3, uh, of course, is a legendary instrument. Um, give me a 30 second overview of what makes it different from your usual keyboard or organ yeah. group and play. Well, the, the B3 has mechanical um, tone wheels. So you have two spinning kind of wheels going right next to each other, and they, they produce a hum. And it's, it was supposed to be meant to um, emulate a pipe organ, mm -hmm. but somehow it kind of created its own little sound. And actually, Lawrence Hammond, the inventor, was a clockmaker, oh, really? and the, the same parts of the clock that were spinning around were the same parts that make the the tones of the tone wheel generator for the Hammond organ. Now, obviously, this is because of the keyboard aspect. There's a similarity between that and the accordion, mm -hmm. but you add the horizontal move. <laughs> yeah, the horizontal. Right? You got pedals yeah. by yeah. your feet. Oh, I didn't mm -hmm. know that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so it's almost like you're a percussionist in a way. Yeah. You're doing, um, one foot's usually on a volume pedal, your left foot's doing the pedals, and you've got two hands going at the same time. Now, you play piano as well? Yeah, play so. piano as well. Um, unfortunately, in the college uh, music programs, there aren't many jazz organ studies um, programs in the country, so I had to go um, through the piano routes, but still played organ throughout. We had Booker T here last year. Oh, that's which wonderful. Was, which, yeah. was, which was marvelous. And you got, I guess, Joey DeFrancisco. Mm -hmm. Give me another couple of big names. Uh, Tony Monaco. Uh, Jimmy Smith was Jimmy pretty Smith. much the inventor of the style right. that okay. we play. All right. um, and then a lot of the old timers like Jimmy McGriff, Jack yeah. McDuff, yeah. Groove Holmes. Yeah. So it's I a wonderful sound. 
and it, I mean, it really is a, it's a swinging sound. Which it is can cool. be. It can be. Yeah. yeah. Or you could take it way out. There was a gentleman, Larry Young, mm -hmm. who played with um, Tony Williams and um, played with uh, John McLaughlin, and he really took the sounds of the Hammond organ out there. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the more swinging version. Mm -hmm. All right. The, uh, the gorilla in the room, if you will, when it comes to playing organ is you do this for a living as well. I do. You are the organist for the Atlanta Braves. Yeah, this is my ninth year. Now, for how Atlanta did Braves. that all come together? <laughs> Dumb luck. Yeah. Really, um, I was teaching um, an adult organ student, and he had... It wasn't um, Chipper Jones, right? It wasn't no. Chipper Jones, no. Okay. <laughs> but he happened to know the guy who was in charge of hiring an organist for the Atlanta Braves. Um, prior to him asking me, they hadn't had one for six years. And... They didn't put any like feelers out. They didn't put any audition things out. He just asked me if I was interested. I said yes. He called his friend. His friend called his boss. I had an interview within a week of being asked without even, you know, even thinking about it. So, now there was a time when every team had an organist, and now mm -hmm. I would guess much less. It's about every, half. It's about yeah. half the teams had because the rest are what on CD or something. Um, well, it's you know all teams have a combination of. MP3s really these days, and um, an organ. So I don't think any team has just organ. Mm. Wrigley, I think, was the last one to kind of hold out on that, but they're starting to have pre-recorded music mm. as well. Now, how much leeway do you have as an organist? Tell the story why the Giants fans. <laughs> you know you. So for you Giants fans, of course, when um, Kung Fu Panda was here, yeah. I would play everyone's Kung Fu fighting. <laughs> but. Um, I, I know that the um, San, San Francisco Giants press, like, um, I guess his name is Andrew Baggerly. Mm -hmm. He loved it when I played Puff the Magic Dragon for Tim Lincecum. <laughs> and so um, and I'll, I'll let you guess why <laughs> yeah, I may have so played good. that song for him. Uh, is that your call, though? <laughs> that Well, a lot of it is through my Twitter page. Do you have so a have, playlist? I, I mean, do, but not from, not from management, or do you, from management? No. Okay. So no, no. So they, they leave it up to me to come up with a song. Okay. As long as it pertains to the batter coming up. Okay. Um, and I throw it out to Twitter. Um, I have a Twitter page at Braves Organist, and and people will send me all sorts of suggestions, and I, I play the one either. Um, Give me one of your favorites. Um. Well, actually, one I'm known for in Atlanta is playing Camp Town Races for Lucas Duda. Well, that's good. And the reason why, you know, <laughs> number one is simple. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why people love that one is because I love it when the crowd participates. Mm -hmm. So I'll start playing that song, and I'll stop in the Duda part. So I had, um, one time I had, you know, 20, 30,000 people singing Duda, mm -hmm. Duda. And um, I think... Uh, Sometimes it may get into the player's head, but I don't know. Now, does Atlanta have a traditional song like, I mean, Sinatra, New York, New York, or Neil Diamond, Sweet Caroline in Boston? Not a traditional song, but do you know what this is? The, uh, well, it's <laughs> incredibly rude for what, no. It's the, it's so the we, Redskins, uh, isn't it? We, we, the, borrowed, their logo? we borrowed the Florida State... Um, Seminoles chop, chop, which is a tomahawk chop, as, yeah. and they call it a tomahawk chop. And the reason why was now is that when Ted owned the team? That was when Ted owned the I'm team. I'm sure that made for some nice dinner conversation <laughs> when he was married to Jane Fonda. Like, why well, he, he had uh, <laughs> it was Deion Sanders actually. Yeah. Uh, Deion Sanders went to Florida State, and um, the previous organist prior to me started playing the chop whenever he would come up mm -hmm. to bat, and it really caught on. So um, I, actually. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, the way you look at it, um, I don't get to play it. They actually, uh, they prefer the marching band pre-recorded version oh, really? of the chop. Now, doing, uh, doing this, obviously, 81 times a year for home games, mm -hmm. um, you do a great deal of side work. Do you mm -hmm. do uh, studio work as well? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah quite a bit. Yeah. And um, do you find yourself, as you're there, kind of working out new riffs while you're in the, while you're in the booth? Yeah, Something actually, you might yeah. use later that evening. Yeah, well, actually, a lot of times um, before the game, I have plenty of time to come up with what I'm playing during the game. Mm -hmm. But I actually also have plenty of time to practice for things like today or for, for things like um, a salsa band that I play with. I play also the accordion in a polka band. <laughs> so I wear well, the, the boond hose. I'm not sure what the proper metaphor is for the number of hats that you wear, but uh, 
Yeah, you know, on any given day, you could be salsa, you could be polka, you could be jazz, mm -hmm. you could be swing, you yeah. could be blues. It's a little, yeah. a little confusing. Well, in Atlanta, you know, there's so many different avenues you could go in music. And I actually also play in a Western swing slash cowboy group called Back in the Saddle. Now, one of the guys who's with you tonight, and we always make this disclaimer because by the time you folks see this, tonight would have been a couple of weeks ago or last week, mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Foreman is yeah. with you. He's an old buddy of mine uh, from Monterey Carmel area. And he did, uh, he had Cowboy Bop. Yeah, yeah Cow Bop. Really yeah. Cow Bop, yeah. And his, yeah, his band is amazing. Yeah. And actually, this will be my first time playing with Bruce, so yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, so just uh, quickly tell the folks who you had that they may have missed and, or, <laughs> or who they enjoyed. Well, evening. on this particular evening, um, I've got Bruce Foreman on guitar. Okay. Um, and actually, I have an LP record from 1982 that I brought for him to sign. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got um, Leon Joyce Jr. on drums. Mm -hmm. And he's a, um, actually a little bit of a Chicago connection. He worked in Chicago for a long time. I've got um, Lyle Link on saxophone, mm -hmm. um, sa local San Francisco saxophonist. And um, Kimberly Gordon. Kimberly Gordon, is, is she in town? Oh, yeah. I'm delighted to hear that. And uh, we'll talk to her in just a second. Matthew, delighted that you're here. Uh, mm -hmm. You are going to knock him dead. And uh, for the folks at home that didn't see it, uh, kick yourself because you should have been out here. <laughs> Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you so much. We're going to take a little break uh, here for the folks at O'Connor Hospital, part of Verity Health. Uh, and also let me take a moment while we still have time. Um, we need you to help support jazz. And not the least of ways is uh, to buy a couple of tickets to the gala which is coming up on July 25th with Herb Albert and Lanny Hall. We're going to take a minute to invest in a jazz card, buy tickets for the raffle, and, uh, and help keep jazz alive. We'll be back to jazz tonight in just a moment. At O'Connor Hospital, we're restoring health together. Step by step, together. Because care is better together. O'Connor, together in health. At O'Connor Hospital, we're shortening your wait time because in an emergency, every minute counts. This is our commitment to you. O'Connor Hospital, together in help. Welcome back to Jazz Tonight. Michael Jacoby with you as uh, we continue our conversation about uh, Matthew Kreminski's show, which is this evening. For those of you watching, it was uh, last week. Uh, with me in the studio, a lot of people say, what happened to Elizabeth Taylor's wardrobe from Cleopatra? Well, this is it. This is, and I love the look. Kimberly Gordon, how yeah. are you, my dear? I'm great, thank you. Delighted to have you here. It's wonderful to be here. You are the lady singer. I am. I am. And you have been described by no less than the iconic Kurt Elling as the real deal. Yes. That is literally praise from Jazz Caesar. It is, yeah. yeah. We go back uh, to our early days in Chicago. Yeah. And I still have the first business card he gave me when he came and sat in on my gig at the Bop Shop. Mm. What an interesting uh, guy. I, Branford Marsalis is a friend of mine, and, and, we, and we play a lot of golf together. Mm -hmm. But I caught him for the first time with, I've seen Branford, but the first time with Kurt Elling mm. uh, at the Coamba. And uh, mm. what a terrific, uh, you know, he's the vocalese. Um, uh, kind of not unlike our friend Giacomo Gates, but also I love Giacomo. very interesting lyrics. And it's the kind of thing that you know demands your attention. Oh, Kurt it's, is yeah. he really reinvented the whole genre of jazz and poetry, and yeah. uh, he's really made his way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I love him, my good buddy. You and did you and Matthew know each other in Chicago? He came out to a wonderful gig that I used to do. Um, I was the house vocalist for 10 years at the Green Mill Lounge okay. in historic uptown Chicago. And uh, I played with an organist um, on the original Al Capone stage with Chris Foreman. And here comes this young guy who wants to sit in. And um, so we worked it out. He came and he sat in and he heard me along with Chris, who was who he was there to see. Yeah. I was the extra. And uh, we just became instant friends and musical pals, and he became a fan and said, would you ever like to come down to Atlanta and perform? I said, yes, of course. So it took a couple years, but I finally went down there, and now he brings me down once or twice a year, and then we recorded the album live at Churchill Grounds yeah. last year. So, You know, it's interesting. The jazz business and the music business, there are so many things 
that have changed over the years, uh, be it from publishing to uh, record labels to do, doing your own production. Mm -hmm. One thing that hasn't changed is the road. And it's, and it's very interesting is that um, you were out with, uh, with Marcellus. I was. I was a gal Friday and yeah. um, a vocalist for uh, Lincoln Center yeah. for, and also Marcus Roberts. Right. And I did my time in New York. I was the first female to hold a residency at Smalls in New York in sure. the village. It's, yeah. I was there for the Renaissance when they first opened. And um, yeah, I did my time and laid a lot of, uh, laid a thick foundation, you know. I, yeah, I did stand-up comedy for a while. I, did you? I liked eating better than performing, so I got out of that business. <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that people tell you, you've got to cut your chops. You have got to get out. And be in front of people. Oh yeah. Same thing for for, for you. Oh, I mean, yes. the, the sing I every just night. Went out get there. out every day. That's right. That's what I tell my students uh, and any young person that comes up and or any age yeah. person that comes up to me and wants to know what to do. I just get out there um, to the envy of many people who spent thousands and thousands of dollars on education. Yeah. I just went out there and worked, yeah. and you know, got some great results. Twenty five years later, I'm. An yeah. overnight success. Doing, doing well, yeah. yeah. I like to travel a lot, and uh, I have, besides working with Matthew, I have my own duo to big band. Okay. So, yeah, yeah you, we were talking off air about you uh, You have Ella's, so Ella's chart. I commissioned uh, a whole cachet of Ella yeah. Fitzgerald charts. Um, a lot of the uh, Billy May, um, Nelson Riddle arrangements. So I've been doing a, a lot of Ella Fitzgerald centennial gigs this year. We are doing it uh, next year. We're doing uh, Elephant oh, Show. Nice. I'll have to come. You should, you should come I'll back and see us. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your uh, formative years, uh, folks in the music. My grandfather was a dancer at the Shapery in Chicago. No kidding. Okay. No kidding. And my grandmother. Tap dancer or ball dancer? Uh, or oh, everything. Okay. Yeah, tap. And he had a, a partner that he worked with. So, um, But of course, they worked everywhere. But they were house dancers at the Shapery. And um, my nana was a camera girl at the Shapery. She got that job for from one of her friends, Sam Jean Kana, that she went to high school with. And uh, so I'm a very big bandy. Um, old movie soundtrack childhood. A lot so of records. So your background's Italian? No, I am, um, uh, my grandmother's Eastern European, mm -hmm. my grandfather is Scotch and a little Native American, and my father's Puerto Rican. Mm. Yeah, so I'm an American mutt. And yet somehow Giancana helped out as well. Well, you know, when you're childhood friends with the Capones and yeah. the Giancanas, yeah. you know, yeah, that'll do it. it'll get you in the nightclub and the music business. How about and mom and dad? No, they were hippies. Yeah. You know, so I grew up with not only uh, At least jazz. you got Kimberly in that sunshine. I know. I was going to be Angel. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Kimberly I'll take. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, I grew up with Ravi Shankar and Joni Mitchell and the soundtrack to Woodstock. So mm. I have a really nice mix of all types of cultures in my sound. Well, so uh, how, how is it that you change the disc or... or, or rotated the dial and came up with an appreciation for ladies like Ella or it was, and I'm sure the, the great male singers It was singers just something well. that my soul attached to from a mm. very young age. I knew mm. that this was my music. Um, Big Dinah Washington fan. I love Dinah Washington, mm. yeah. You know, but I also love Judy Garland. I right. mean, Judy Garland, Liza mm. Minnelli. Um, Julie Holiday, Judy Holiday. <laughs> Peggy Alice, Lee, yeah. Anita O'Day. Yeah. Um, my, my Nana's favorite was Sarah Vaughan, mm. Billie Holiday. Yeah. It was basically Billie Holiday was number one in our house right. growing up. Yeah. And to this day, whenever I see this one particular album set that I grew up with, I have to buy it every time because I lost my first copy. Mm -hmm. So now every time I see my Billie Holiday box set yeah. at a yard sale or a state sale, yeah. I buy it. So yeah. I have a huge collection of Billie Holiday's albums. Well, you're doing something tonight or, I am. or in We're our case, represent. you did it last week. We're um, represent. It's one of those very interesting um, songs. It was written in 1954, Billie Holiday. Who was the other writer, you remember? Uh, Caught me off guard. Uh, Billy, but oh, Lady what, Sings the Blues. Yes, one, I was going to say, <laughs> one of the very interesting titles that was not only the title of an album, 1954, yes, title of a popular. song, title of her autobiography, yes. and the title of the movie. Yes. Yeah. It's a great so, title. Yeah. I can't remember who did uh, the music. She, I think, wrote the lyrics. Uh, I don't know who did the music. We'll, we'll know that tonight. Um, talk a little bit about, I love your ring, by the way. Thank you. It's my pet newt. 
You could, that sounds like a political remark, doesn't it, a pet <laughs> newt? Um, it's very pretty. Um, talk to me, not only, not only as a singer, but, it, but as a woman, mm. um, Billie Holiday, what she meant to you. Well, it's funny, you know, listening to her sing, I really thought that she was singing just for me. And I think that's her gift, is she connects with her listener on such a deep level that really I thought she was all mine yeah. until I got older and realized that other people liked her too or yeah. loved her as well. So she has that intimacy in her voice and that real life experience that comes through that we all go through at some point or another. So we can all relate to that. Well, it's been very interesting this year because we always, since we started doing themes, which was four or five years ago, um, and, and we always have the performer do something from the theme artist. But the reverence the artists have, both instrumental um, and vocalist for Billie Holiday is really remarkable. It's uh, uh, Antonia Bennett, whom we opened with this year, oh, yes, Tony's yes, daughter. Yes. She said, well, well, I can't do strange fruit. I'm white and I can't do no, that. I've only and, but, done it once. But Paula West, who is once. a dear friend of ours, she said there's certain things you're not even going to try. You're not going to No, I, I don't sing God Bless the Child. Up. Exactly. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Yeah. It never needs to be sung again. It's like a young person singing Lush Life. You know, exactly. it just doesn't fit. You know. I did not sing Lush Life until I hit 30. Yeah. And I knew and that you were drinking you have to heavy wait. at the time. You but have to wait. That, you got to wait until you're ready. <laughs> you got to wait till you, you got to wait. Until not till you, you have. Really there are certain songs, it's not about having the chops, it's about having the experience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, you do. Uh, you go to the studio a lot? Have you got a lot of CDs on your own? Um, I do have a few. My last one was my organ trio. Um, called Sunday, okay. uh, representing the Sunday nights I did at the Green Mill for yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Chris Foreman on organ, who was Matthew's... Uh, um, so is that a, uh, a, idol, a totally different mindset than, than playing with a pianist? It is, and you know, the organ really speaks to me. I met Chris uh, 23 years ago when I was a singing waitress at the Underground Wonder Bar in Chicago, and we met, he's without sight, um, he was stumbling up the aisle. Well, Marcus as well, isn't he? Yes, he is. Okay. Yeah, right. Marcus Roberts. Right. Mm -hmm. I wasn't his left-hand man, right. but um, with Chris, I saw him, and I automatically went up to him and offered him my elbow, yeah. and he was so impressed with the fact that I did it the correct way, because yeah. a lot of people will grab uh, the sightless yeah. and grab them and walk them. You're not supposed to do that. You put, give them your arm. So... We clicked right away, yeah. and uh, he said, uh, uh, Kim, you, you have a lot of blind friends? <laughs> no, no, but I've got <laughs> You're one You're my more. first one. Yeah. And uh, he sat in that night. I sang with him, and we were That's attached wonderful. to the hip ever since. We did piano. We did organ. And then uh, when I finally did uh, rent the organ, I used to pay $220 when I was making $60 on a gig <laughs> to rent the organ and tip the organ delivery guy because I felt so strongly yeah. about that sound. When I heard that organ and Chris and I together, it just pumps right through you. Yeah. And I just knew that that was my music. And nobody was doing it on the you know north side. Um, it had been on the south side for yeah. years, but had sort of found um, a quiet place. And the decline of the nightclubs and the south side scene um, really put the organ at risk, or live organ music. So I kind of was one of those first people to bring it back, and especially vocalists with organ. Yeah. Nobody was doing that. I was the first one to, well, that, to bring that so back. We got just a couple of minutes left. Real sure. quickly, bucket yeah, yeah. list. What do you have on your list to uh, maybe record or do? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, I'd say live at Smalls, live at Smalls. would be go my back. ideal, to yeah. go back home. Go back smalls home. in New York, yeah. That would be neat. Do a live album there. That would be neat. A joy to see you. Thank, thank you, you for coming out. It's Such nice a pleasure. to meet a fellow Chicago traveler. And, uh, yeah, thank you so uh, much yeah. for having we me. We are very much looking forward to it. And we really enjoyed it, by the way. Uh, Kimberly Gordon, thank you. Thank you. That My is uh, Kimberly Gordon and Matthew Kaminsky uh, for uh, Jazz on the Plaz. We are so delighted that they're in town. It's going to be a great evening. Look forward next week uh, to our good friend Nicholas Beard with Full Spectrum Jazz. That is Jazz Tonight. Thanks to good folks at O'Connor Hospital, part of Verity Health. And thank you for helping keep jazz alive. Thank you. In other words.
You 